JWST launched with the goal of peering back to the universe's dawn. But what it found was a complete surprise. Tiny, incredibly luminous little red dots scattered all over the early universe. These objects, believed to be some of the universe's first galaxies powered by supermassive black holes, just shouldn't exist, at least according to our current models. They are so massive that there wouldn't have been enough time for them to grow to that size since the Big Bang, which suggests that our theories of cosmic evolution are fundamentally flawed. But a new study may have just solved that mystery. These little red dots may not be galaxies after all, but instead primordial black holes. Hey Space Cats, I'm Dr. Maggie Lou, and in this week's video, let's talk about LRDs and primordial black holes. It was surprising when the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, first found the little red dots, 341 of them so far. But they are extremely difficult to observe, even with JWST. This is the very limit of the telescope's observing capability. Now, it was unclear what they were. They appear to mostly have existed about 600 million years after the Big Bang, so about 13.2 billion years ago. And the leading theory was that these LRDs are a form of galaxy from the very early universe or a primordial galaxy. However, this is a problem because our current models of cosmology struggle to explain how such massive objects could form so quickly in our young universe. Their extreme brightness and red colour are very unusual, and some models even suggest that their mass is overestimated by up to two orders of magnitude. Or it could be that they are stars, also known as population three stars. These could be the very first stars in our universe, formed from the pristine metal-free gas after the Big Bang that were theorized to be massive and short-lived. Now, new results from one particular little red dot may change everything. It's called ABAL 2744QSO1, or simply QSO1, and it's a strongly lensed object at a redshift of 7.04, which places it at about 28 billion light years away today. Now that's incredibly far, and the only reason that we see it at all is thanks to gravitational lensing. QSO1 sits behind Pandora's cluster, ABAL 2744, whose enormous mass bends and amplifies the light from this distant object. In fact, the cluster's gravity is so strong that it produces three separate images of QSO1. This is the most distant gravitationally lensed object ever found. Astronomers have known about it since the early JWST observations in 2022, and there were hints that it could contain an accreting black hole, so a black hole that is actively feeding on gas and dust around it. Those claims, however, were based on the Virial theorem, and this is a principle that links the motion of gas or stars to the mass of the object holding them in place. It's one way that we use to estimate the masses of black holes nearby, but applying it to galaxies so far away is kind of risky, since we don't know if the same relations and physics still hold in that very early universe. The study used JWST's high-resolution near-spec integral field spectroscopy to measure how gas is moving around QSO1. In astronomy, we often track this motion using emission lines. So these are bright signatures in the spectrum produced when atoms in hot gas emit light at very specific wavelengths. Now, one of the strongest of these is the H-alpha line, which comes from hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. This figure shows what that H-alpha emission looks like. The left panel maps the brightness of the narrow H-alpha line, essentially showing where the glowing hydrogen gas is concentrated. The dashed green ellipse marks the size and shape of JWST's blurring effect, known as the point spread function, the PSF. And the smaller red ellipse shows the positional accuracy of the measurement. The middle panel is the velocity map, which reveals how the gas is moving relative to the center of the object, marked by that black star. 
Here, the red regions represent gas moving away from us and the blue regions show gas moving towards us. Together, they form a clear velocity gradient, a classic signature that that gas is rotating around some central object. But to be very certain, astronomers needed to zoom in even further. So to do this, they use a method known as spectroastrometry. It's a clever trick where we squeeze extra information out of light, even if a telescope's images aren't sharp enough to show it directly. So when a telescope's resolution is too low, small objects will blur together. And here we're definitely smaller than JWST's PSF and blurring scale. But the light carries more than just brightness. It also has a spectrum, tiny shifts in wavelength that tells us about motion thanks to the Doppler effect. In spectroastrometry, astronomers measure those tiny changes in the apparent position of light at different wavelengths. One side of an object is moving towards us and the other side is moving away. The light shifts slightly in opposite directions. By carefully measuring those shifts, we can actually detect rotation and structure on scales that are much smaller than the telescope's normal resolution. Think about it like this. It's kind of like being unable to see the blades of a spinning fan, but noticing that the sound coming from one side is slightly higher pitched than the other side, then from that you could work out that the fan is spinning even though you never actually see the blades directly. So using this method, they were able to resolve the rotation and make this plot. This is a rotation curve showing the velocity of the gas at different distances from the center. Notice the scale. Those pink points are less than 50 kiloparsecs from the center of the object. So smaller than a pixel on the IFS data. They couldn't have made it without spectral astrometry. And the shape perfectly matches Keplerian rotation. Now, this is a hallmark of a compact, dense system like a black hole, controlling the motion of the surrounding gas. The data was a perfect fit for a Kepler model of rotation around a point mass of about 10 million solar masses, as shown by the solid line. But this is also a lower limit, since they don't know the inclination or the orientation of the rotation. It didn't fit well to other models like it being a nuclear star cluster, as you can see by the dotted line. So to get a more complete and robust measurement, they measured an independent analysis using Mocha 3D, a more sophisticated 3D kinematic modeling tool. And this tool accounts for instrumental effects such as the point spread function, the PSF, as well as the inclination of the rotating disk. And with this method, they estimated the inclination of the rotating disk to be about 52 degrees, placing the best fit mass at log mass of 7.7, .7, which is about 50 million solar mass masses. The Kepler rotation curves don't leave much room for any stellar components, and they actually measure the amount of stars from the UV light and find that just 20 million solar masses is in the form of stars. So this really is a system that is mostly black hole, or a naked black hole. Now, a 50 million solar mass supermassive black hole is really, really big. In comparison to the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, Sagittarius A star is just 4 million solar masses. The discovery of such a massive naked black hole so early in the universe suggests that black holes may form and grow much faster than their host galaxies, a concept known as black hole primacy. And this only leads to two conclusions. Either this is a primordial black Black hole. So unlike the more common black holes that we know of today, which form from the collapse of massive stars, primordial black holes wouldn't require stars at all. Therefore, to have formed from the gravitational collapse of extremely dense regions of subatomic matter in the early chaotic universe. Or it could be a direct collapse black hole. So these would form directly collapsing from the massive pristine gas clouds that didn't fragment to form stars. The study slightly flavors the primordial black hole scenario over the direct collapse black hole scenario because the specific environment conditions required for direct collapse black holes were not observed. Now, this is actually really interesting because primordial black holes are a prime candidate for being dark matter, the mysterious substance that makes up most of the universe's mass, but we still have no idea what it is. 
and this is because they aren't formed from either stars or gas. So, if this study holds true, then it may be that we need to revise our theories of early galaxy and black hole formation. That the universe's first black holes may have been far more prominent than previously thought. And maybe we have an answer to our dark matter problem. But for now, that's our too massive, too soon paradox solved. That's all I have time for this week. Thank you to my YouTube Perks members for supporting. You can too if you join below. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to leave me a like, share and subscribe.